So what we've done in this experiment is in the top panel, we've just looked at P53 status in normal tissues of a mouse that only makes mutant P53. And you can see clearly there's no stable mutant P53. However, in the bottom panel, if we take out MDM2, you can see that we've stabilized that mutant P53 in many, many, many cells of many, many tissues. And this generates a mouse that is more uh, tumor prone. So here I now have the survival curves of a mouse that has only the mutant P53. And this mouse has no metastasis in contrast to the heterozygous mouse. And again, our naive interpretation was that this mouse didn't have time to develop mets before it was dying of a primary tumor. However, here in red are the animals that have no MDM2, and they've stabilized this P53 mutant. And you can see a shift to the left. These animals died sooner, and now we see 30% mets in these cases. So what we've done in this experiment is we've artificially stabilized in, uh, P53 by taking out MDM2, and that led to this most more aggressive metastatic phenotype. Now this is the model that um, I sort of put together one evening, and I'm going to have to modify it based on what I've learned today about ovarian cancer. But the, the, the model basically says that unless you stabilize that mutant P53 protein, you don't have this aggressive metastatic phenotype. And to me, what's going to be critical is the timing at which the mutant P53 becomes stable. Because if it's a very early event, as it is in ovarian cancer, <coughs> I think it's going to lead to um, a metastatic, more aggressive phenotype much earlier than in other tumors, for example, here, who have a mutant P53 but haven't stabilized that protein. So um, numerous in studies by numerous investigators have attempted to understand the mechanisms by which P53 contributes to uh, gain of function effects, and metastasis is the major one. Um, it was uh, Carol Privis's lab that showed that uh, mutant P53 can bind and inhibit the function of two other tumor suppressors, P63 and P73. Uh, Karen Bouston published this interacts with integrin recycling. It affects uh, metastasis and invasion in those experiments. Um, another group of investigators have shown that um, interactions with other DNA binding proteins uh, contributes to the gain of function effect. And I think there are several studies here, and I'm just going to summarize them. Um, so Carol Curtis showed that SREPP binds to mutant P53, uh, Barda Rotter, vitamin D receptor, and Luis Martinez in my lab, ETS2. So basically, the idea here is that um, these are all, these three are all DNA binding proteins, and they activate transcription of their target genes. And what mutant P53 does by interacting with these DNA binding transcription factors, it brings a very potent transcriptional activation domain. So basically, P53 is driving a new transcription of the um, I'm going to switch gears now and talk about some of the models that we've developed to study. Uh, therapeutics and how different tumors respond to uh, and to uh, restoration of P53. So first, um, this is a model, which is the MMTD Wnt driven breast cancer model that Hal Varmus established a number of years ago, and um, we did a doxorubicin study in this animal, five weekly doses of doxorubicin at the dose that uh, equivalent dose that patients would see. On the left are those tumors that had wild type P53. On the right are those tumors that had mutant P53. And a surprise for us um, from the get-go was that t those tumors that had a mutant P53 responded better and relapsed later. So the numbers are down here. Uh, basically, the oops, sorry. <laughs> The P53 wild type tumors uh, lost 35% uh, of the tumor volume after doxorubicin treatment, while the mutant tumors lost 68% of the tumor volume. The wild type tumors relapsed in 11 days, and the mutant P53 tumors relapsed in 24 days. We were surprised. I mean, given what we know about P53 and its function as a tumor suppressor, we really thought that the wild type response was going to be better. But as you'll see in a few minutes, it's very clear why why the mutant P53 tumors respond better. First, let me tell you what happens with wild type P53. Wild type P53 after doxorubicin treatment becomes transcriptionally active and the cells, the tumor cells stop growing. So this is a uh, BRDU experiment which, so, which shows the tumors 
on the left before treatment are cycling rapidly and on the right they've stopped cycling. And in fact, what we initiate in this case, in this scenario, is a senescent program. So we initiate activation of the P21 uh, cell cycle inhibitor and a slew of <laughs> other um, of other senescent markers. And so these tumors turn bright blue, as is shown on this uh, panel on the right. Um, but what happens with senescent tumors is that they begin to express a chemokine cytokine signature, and our tumors do that as well. So this is a, a panel of a whole different uh, series of chemokines and cytokines that basically show when these cells are senescent after treatment, they express a large number of these uh, chemokines and cytokines. And so normally a senescent cell needs these to remain alive in its senescent state, but I think what happens in this tumor is a few cells that have not terminally senesced um, use then the chemokine signature to start growing very rapidly. And I'll have a model in a few minutes to summarize the data. So this is what happens in a wild type P53. We initiate a senescent program that is easily overcome. So what happens in mutant P53? So what happens in mutant P53 is you don't, basically you don't have a, um, a senescent program. You don't have inhibition of the cell cycle. So here is a B BRDU experiment on the right hand side. These are the mutant P53 tumors. The cells continue to cycle. So what happens is the cells continue to cycle in the presence of DNA damage. And the result is entry into mitosis with damaged DNA, double strand breaks, and a mitotic catastrophe. So that's why the mutant P53 tumors respond better. And I think we can take advantage of this in the clinic. Um, this slide is just showing that in a breast cancer cell line, MCF7 cells, that express wild type P53. What we've done here is used an siRNA approach to down modulate that wild type P53. We get a senescent program. Here are the blue cells. And then again, when we look at these samples that have down modulated P53 and have been treated with doxorubicin, you see these broken nuclei, you see these uh, DNA strands that are trying to divide, but the cells can't divide. So the bottom line is even in a human cell line, down modulating P53 and initiating uh, DNA damage with doxorubicin produced uh, this uh, mitotic catastrophe. So this is our model, basically wild type P53 uh, when treat Wild-type P53 WINT-driven breast tumors, when treated with doxorubicin, in, induce a senescent program, which is quickly overcome because of the presence of chemokines and cytokines that the senescent cells express. However, if the P53, um, if the tumors have a mutant P53, doxorubicin induces an, a P53 independent, independent apoc apoptotic program because the cycling cells go into uh, mitosis with DNA damage. And studies I didn't have time to show, I just, I'm, I'm really convinced of this data and it was an experiment where we looked at LOH to determine whether, um, what happened when that wild type allele was retained or not. So in every case where we retained the wild type allele, so this is a mutant heterozygous tumor, senescence was the readout and a, a short relapse was the, another readout. But if the tumors lost that second allele, uh, treatment with doxorubicin induced uh, apoptosis via a uh, mitotic catastrophe. So people don't, in, in terms of the clinic, um, people have started to pay more attention to the kinds of mutations that tumors have, but very few people pay attention to LOH, and this is a perfect experiment where the LOH, um, what happened to that wild type P53 allele mattered. Um, and just briefly, I don't know how I'm doing on time, we've also generated animal models to genetically restore uh, P53 in tumors to ask what happens to tumors. Um, and in the first uh, panel here, we've restored P53 in a tumor that has no P53 because P53 is lost uh, intentionally in this case. Um, this is a sarcoma that um, after 18 days of treatment, um, by genetically restoring P53 completely disappears. Um, however, here in the bottom panel, this is a tumor that now in, now in which we restored 
wild type P53 in a mutant background. And I think you can clearly see from this tumor is we stopped the tumor from growing. It didn't continue to grow, but it didn't go away. So there's this, this uh, stasis, I think, um, between expression of wild type P53 and a mutant background. Um, the last player is MDM2. Um, while it's not pertinent to ovarian cancers, I don't think, because the, most of them mutate P53, <coughs> one way to bypass a P53 mutation is to overexpress the inhibitor, MDM2. And again, when we restore P53 in these experiments, what you get here in this top graph is stasis. The tumor doesn't grow, um, as opposed to a, the tumor continuing to grow if, if you don't restore P53. So again, context matters. The, this slide simply shows the comparison. This is a tumor volume on the left, uh, the black bars, where we've not restored P53, P53 and the tumors continue to grow. And then in the right, we've restored P53 and you can see that the tumor volume stays um, st at, at stasis. Okay, so let me summarize then um, some of the things that we've learned from the animal models in the P53 field. Mesense mutations represent about 80% of the kinds of mutations that occur in P53 in tumors. Um, and when stabilized, a mutant P53 shows these gain-of-function activities. So in the absence of that stability, you don't have these inappropriate protein-protein interactions that drive uh, metastases. Uh, tumors that initiate uh, P53 dependent dependent senescence program respond poorly to DNA damaging agents in contrast um, to mutant P53 tumors. Uh, context is very important. I just showed you that if you restore P53 in the absence of P53, you can get the tumor to dissolve, but not if there's a mutant uh, P53 or if you've got high levels of MDM2. I think in these tumors what you've got is you've got this, this tug of war between um, restoring P53 and, and, and not quite doing enough. Um, the last uh, concept I don't have any data for, but there's uh, evidence for in tissue culture, and there is data impressed in Nature from Utah Moles Lab that shows that tumors might be addicted to mutant P53. So if you can take out mutant P53, you might be able to wipe out the tumor. So last but not least, my lab um, got lots of people to thank for all of these experiments. So thank you, finally. Thank you.